and welcome, wherever you are. I'm the minister of Blort Hill Church and interim moderator of St Columba Gallic Church, Glasgow, Scotland. You're very welcome to join us to worship today. I want to give a little plug at the start to the new Gallic Church online channel on YouTube. If you know any Gallic speakers, please tell them about it. The latest service today has already been posted, but it won't be appearing until nine o'clock tomorrow, Sunday morning. You can get there by following the links on the St. Columba website at www.highlandcathedral.org.uk. I have to confess that I only know a few words of Gaelic, so I have to rely on fluent Gaelic speakers to prepare the sermons and the prayers. However, I am a native Doric speaker, and I'm seriously thinking about posting a service in Doric one of these Sundays. It's something I've actually never done, so maybe it's about time I was giving it a wee shotty. However, in my best standard English, here is today's service from Glasgow. Today is the beginning of Christian Aid Week, so our worship today has Christian Aid in mind, using the lectionary readings, but following some of the themes suggested by Christian Aid. In church, this is the Sunday that the little red envelopes would have been in the pews for our members to take away and put in a donation. Christian Aid is the only charity, being the church's charity, that we do support in this direct way, although our members, of course, fundraise for a number of other charities as well. So, because you won't be getting a little red envelope this year, I'll tell you at the end of the service how you can donate online if you wish to. Now, at the beginning of this service, let's draw together with God. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father and friend, you gave us Jesus to be the cornerstone of the church, in which we as members of his body are also living stones. Let us stand firm on your foundation whenever we are weak, and still trust you whenever we feel strong. Whenever we are anxious, make us more confident. Whenever we are too proud, make us humble. Whenever we are frightened, make us brave. Whenever we are foolish, make us sound. When we do wrong, forgive our sins. And whenever we get things right, let us be as happy as the children of God have a right to be. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Our service today has three readings. The first is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verses 55 to 60, and it's being read for us today by Lorna McLean. This is from Acts, chapter 7, verses 55 to 60. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily upward into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honour at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honour at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and drowning out his voice with their shouts and rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. The official witnesses took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And as he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And then he died. Amen. So this passage relates the dreadful episode of the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Stephen had been commissioned by the Twelve as a church leader. However, his outspoken views quickly got him into trouble with the authorities, who found him guilty of blasphemy. The sentence was death by stoning. As it was carried out, we are told that a young man named Saul, who would later change his name to Paul, 
is standing there on the edge of the crowd and his role is to look after the coats of the men who carried out the execution. One of the most pressing problems in our world, at least it was before COVID-19, is man-made global warming. This problem affects the poorest people of our world more than any. The biggest contributor to global warming, warming is the use of fossil fuels. And currently, the Church of Scotland is under pressure to disinvest from the big oil companies who extract and process the fossil fuels that are doing so much damage to the planet. And a disproportionate amount of that damage is felt by the very poorest of our world. It seems like a no-brainer. Take what little money the church has got away from companies like BP and Shell and the rest of them. After all, doesn't it seem like we are holding their coats metaphorically, making it easier for them to do their dirty work? Yet, the biggest investors in green energy are the oil companies. Companies that are far bigger than any of the green startups with far more financial clout. If the oil companies stopped extracting oil tomorrow, the world would literally grind to a halt. So the changeover needs to be fast enough to save the planet, yet measured enough to manage a smooth changeover to renewable energy and sustainable manufacturing processes that go along with it. The last companies the church should be disinvesting from, in my opinion, are the oil giants. We need to ensure from the inside, as shareholders, that the pace of change is just right. Not driven certainly by billionaires who've got a personal interest in keeping things as they are, but ensuring that they invest more and more in renewable resources. And in just the same way, we need a voice to keep other major companies supporting people in the developing world and not exploiting them. Christian Aid is currently lobbying our government to set and meet climate targets that keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. Christian Aid works in many developing nations itself and with partner organisations to achieve social justice and an equitable standard of living for all. We have to be smart enough to know when to change our ways. When we're holding the coats for those who are stoning the poor. And when we're helping those whose past record may not have been perfect to change and to consider the poor and the planet before profit. And that's the difficult choice that we have to make. Second Samuel chapter 14 a woman said to King David, You are like an angel of God and can discern good from evil. May the Lord your God be with you. Well, we must ask God to be with us and help us to know the difference between good and evil in a world which is seldom black and white. Our second lesson today, which Lorna will read again, is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2. Stones can be used to destroy or to build. Peter writes about the living Christ, whom he compares to the cornerstone of a building. First Peter chapter 2 You must crave pure spiritual milk so that you can grow into the fullness of your salvation. Cry out for this nourishment as a baby cries for milk. Now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness, come to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by the people, but he is precious to God who chose him. And now God is building you as a living stone into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are God's holy priests who offer the spiritual sacrifices that please him because of Jesus Christ. As the scriptures express it, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem, a chosen cornerstone, and anyone who believes in him will never be disappointed. Yes, he is very precious to you who believe, but for those who reject him, the stone was rejected by the builders, 
has now become the cornerstone. And the scriptures say, He is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that will make them fall. They stumble because they do not listen to God's word or obey it, and so they meet the fate that has been planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are the chosen people. You are a kingdom of priests, God's holy nation, his very own possession. That is is so you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you received none of God's mercy, now you have received his mercy. Amen. I was saying that it's not always easy to know which side to stand on in this world. But if we let God be with us, he'll help us as he helped King David, who was famous actually for not always making wise choices. Saul was probably standing on the wrong side when he held those coats, but his experience that day would have helped him to set out on the road to change. It must have got him thinking that experience about this religion that Stephen was so passionate about and whether he was indeed right to stand with the persecutors. Peter also reflects on how that which is good is not always immediately obvious, even the perfect good of God in Christ Jesus. The stone that was Christ, Peter writes, was first rejected before he became the cornerstone of God's spiritual temple, the church. Peter teaches the key to discerning good is listening to God's word and obeying it. Those who don't do that will find that that cornerstone is for them merely a stumbling block. Peter was keen to encourage those first small groups of Christians to live for God and so change the world. To do that, Peter knew, just as Jesus himself had taught, that they needed a rock-solid foundation. From that founding cornerstone, they could then step out in confidence and begin to change the world, bringing good news to the poor. Our third and final reading is from the Gospel according to St John, chapter 14, and This reading is read for us by Norma Leckenby. The Gospel reading is taken from St John, chapter 14, reading from verses 1 to 14. Jesus, the way to the Father. Don't be troubled. You trust God. Now trust in me. There are many rooms in my Father's home, and I am going to prepare a place for you. If this were not so, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know where I am going and how to get there. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We haven't any idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had known who I am, then you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Philip, Don't you even yet know who I am, even after all the time I have been with you? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking to see him? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say are not my own, but my Father, who lives in me, does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of what you have seen me do. The truth is, 
Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. Yes, ask anything in my name, and I will do it. Amen. John tells us that here God is building his stones into a building. It is the Father's house, built with living stones, the faithful people of God. The disciples at this point are full of fear for what may happen to them, but Jesus calms their fears. In God's kingdom, there is a place for them. His kingdom is like a massive stone-built mansion which has got many rooms, what better image for the world God wants for us all than a dwelling place that has room for everyone? This is a message of hope and joy for the fearful, for the weak, for the outcast. The Christian understanding of God's kingdom is that it is inclusive, where none are left out, particularly those who find themselves weak and dispossessed in worldly terms. Here is a message of hope for our times, when things are bad for so many. But it is a particular message of hope for those who are the least able to protect themselves against hardship and misfortune at the start of this year's Christian Aid Week. Now, our prayers. We start with the joint prayer of churches and Christian organisations across Scotland. Let us pray. Come, Jesus Christ, come my way, showing me your way through these disorientating days and opening my eyes to your accompanying presence. Come, Lord Jesus, come my way, teaching me your truth through these confounding days and opening my mind to your living word. Come, Jesus Christ, come my way, revealing to me your life through these bewildering days and opening my heart to the fullness of your being. Lord, we pray, even in these difficult times, there is much that we should thank you for. A dedicated and skilled health service to look after us when we're unwell. Shops full of food and people to deliver it if we can't get there ourselves. Willing volunteers to run food banks and support the needy. Charities dedicated to supporting the world's poorest people even in these times when fundraising is so much harder, thinking especially today of the work of Christian Aid. We pray for Christian Aid, for all who work for it, and those who continue to support it. And for the Church, still able to spread the Gospel message through the wonders of the internet and social media, Father, we thank you for the work of the Church. Hear this our prayer for your world, and for the very poorest who are always the first to suffer in times of crisis. Hear our prayer for your church as it meets the spiritual needs of all the communities it serves. Hear our prayer for all who are in special need this day, hit hard by the requirements to stay apart from others. Hear our prayer for those who mourn the loss of loved ones, whether through the coronavirus or from any other cause and hear our own prayers for those we love. Gracious God, all these prayers we offer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I invite you to join me in saying with me the Lord's Prayer now. Let's pray again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you and all whom you love, this day and forevermore. Amen. Why not light a candle again tonight and as you put it in your window, say a wee prayer yourself for everybody who's affected in any way by the COVID-19 pandemic. The candle reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world and he gives us hope and courage in these times. You might have spotted that my candle behind me is, is already lit there. It's alongside my Christian Aid tin as well. And um, if you feel able to give a donation to Christian Aid, perhaps um, not through the little red envelopes, uh, which you won't have this this year, but if you want to carry on the, the work, uh, please go to the Christian Aid website or its Facebook page, and on both you'll find a donate button. And if you're able to make an offering for the work of the church, you can go to our Blowart Hill website at www.blowarthillchurch.org. Click the donate button to take you to the donate page and then look for the yellow PayPal button. We don't expect you to make a donation if you're on reduced income or if your job has gone, but if you were used to putting your offering into the plate on the Sunday and you can no longer do this, then the donate button is a good way to keep your support going for the next little while. We do very much appreciate all the donations we get. Goodbye for now, stay safe, and thank you for joining us. Bye. <laughs>